All right. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us uh, for this week's Snack and Chat, Adopt for Life's weekly Facebook Live, where we explore topics that are top of mind for families formed by adoption, kinship, and customary care. My name is Chantal, Community Engagement Liaison with Adopt for Life, and um, I'm going to be introducing our our guest and our guest host today. Um, and I'll be here monitoring the chat. Um, so if you have any questions or comments, um, I'll pass them along. And also posting any links uh, for resources and key takeaways from today's discussion. So I'll introduce um, our special guest host who was here last, but in case you missed, uh, it's uh, Nancy Lockwood. So thank you, Nancy, for taking time out of your busy day to be with us. Uh, and today our host, or not our host, sorry, our guest is Yvonne Williams. And we're talking about, well, how to talk about FASD. And we received so many questions from our community. So um, I don't wanna take up too much more time so we can get to um, all those very important questions. So whether you're watching right now live, maybe you're watching this later um, on replay, thank you for taking time to be with us. Um, as I said, you can put your questions and comments in the chat and we will do our best to uh, get to all of them. I do um, want to take a moment just to remind everyone that this is being live streamed on our public Facebook page. So when you are asking your questions, we ask you to be mindful and not include any identifying information as it is available on the pub in the public realm. So uh, with that in mind, um, I'm going to get right to it and introduce our guest host, Nancy Lockwood is an FASD consultant and educator with over 25 years of work and lived experience supporting individuals of all ages with FASD. Uh, currently, uh, her work includes building capacity at provincial and national agencies to increase their ability to support people of all ages with FASD and facil facilitating, facilitating excuse me, support groups for caregivers. Previously, Nancy managed Able To's Fetal Alcohol Resource Program, a program she helped to design in collaboration with Kids Brain Health Network, CHEO, and the Children's Aid Society of Ottawa. Nancy has provided customized FASD education workshops to thousands of professionals and frontline workers in multiple sectors. So thank you again, Nancy, for being here. And Yvonne, Yvonne is a mom to a 23-year-old daughter with FASD. Over the years, she has attended and presented at workshops, conferences, and trainings. Her popular blog, Our Sacred Breath, has been a source of information and advocacy since 2014. She is an active member of the Red Shoes Rock Awareness Campaign, created the 99 Days to FAS Day series, served on the advisory panel for the creation of the Ontario FASD website, co-founded the Ontario FASD Action Network and recently joined the board of directors for FAS World. She has been a volunteer moderator for a number of FASD groups on Facebook and currently works part-time for Noble Initiatives. In her free time, I'm surprised you actually have free time. <laughs> she loves to read, be in nature and take pictures of the moon. She wants to continue with her daughter to share their stories and hopes uh, someday to purchase a tiny home and live in a community with like-minded people. So a very warm welcome to Yvonne. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, I'm making time um, to be on Snack and Chat today. I'm excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Um, I'll just pass it over to you, Nancy, if that's okay. Sure. Thanks, Chantal. And I just want to say I'm really excited for this interview, Yvonne. I've told you before, you're one of my FASD superheroes. <laughs> You've made a really big impact in the FASD community. So thank you. Um, and before we get to the submitted questions from parents and caregivers, just wondering if you could start by telling us if you're comfortable more about your own journey raising your daughter and how it brought you to where you are now. Uh, sure. I adopted uh, my daughter, Nicole, when she had just turned eight, and she has just recently turned 23, so we've been together for 15 years. When I adopted her, she had a confirmed diagnosis of ADHD, um, as well as an attachment disorder, which you're likely to find in many um, with uh, adoption, and there was a uh, 
uh, suspicion of FASD, but it, it wasn't confirmed. So I didn't really didn't really learn a lot about FASD in the beginning, I suppose. I, I focused a lot on her, on her attachment and her, her ADHD. And I was lucky enough that uh, I spent a year at home on leave when I first got her. I didn't think I'd need to. And so I told my boss, nah, I probably won't need the full year. I'm okay. <laughs> you know, about three months in, I thought, mm, no, probably going to need this whole year. Um, so we had a good sort of basis really to start. She was just a, a little bundle of energy, a sweet person, always wanted to help, you know, listened, you know, I couldn't, couldn't have asked for, for a better, a better uh, daughter at the time and, and really didn't see a lot of, a lot of, uh, you know, behaviors or symptoms coming out uh, until I sort of returned to work. And she had a great grade two teacher the first year who really understood her and, uh, you know, worked with her but then as she moved into the next grades the teachers weren't quite as aware and then I was commuting I was an hour away so it wasn't always easy for me to get home um, and we just started to see some of the stuff that really happens a lot um, you know she was having more meltdowns I really wasn't aware of what I was doing to you know in not cause them, but not help them, I suppose. Yeah. Um, and I ended up having to sort of quit my job uh, because of that. And um, we had, we'd called the police. I remember the first time I called the police, though, the six foot two officer comes in the house and looks around it at the stuff and says to me, if that was my child, that wouldn't happen. You know, and I felt, wow, <laughs> you know, I, where am I supposed to go when somebody I call for help isn't, you know, really helping me here? And we'd been told to take her to the hospital, so we'd taken her to the hospital. But we live in a really small area, and so by the time we take her anywhere, she's sort of regulated, and and uh, right. they they send us back on our way. Um, so again, we struggled with a lot. Um, finally, uh, one of the pediatricians uh, said to me, you know, take her to the crisis clinic mental health crisis clinic. We did that. Uh, but then she told them that I hit her, um, which wasn't really the truth. I never hit her. Um, but that's probably what happened in her last life. And so that's what she yeah. felt she needed to say. But that actually opened up an investigation, which was closed quickly, but it created lots of services for us. Oh, um, interesting. So I had a lot of a lot of support really throughout her her probably from 13 to 18. Uh, we had some really good services involved. Not to say things weren't happening. School was a bit of a nightmare for us on and off. Yeah. Uh, she did graduate uh, by the skin of her teeth, but we got her there and she had, you know, attended the ceremony um, and uh, so pleased for that. Um, but, you know, realize that there wasn't a lot around as I was raising her. It was more when she got to be about 16, 17, that sort of more groups were coming out. There was more awareness. Uh, so I started really getting involved with uh, advocacy sort of on that part. And as I grew too, as a, as a parent, because um, mm -hmm. I felt real, I was alone and I didn't really have a lot of support, didn't have a lot of mentors to look to. Um, so I just started you know, sharing what I could and getting involved where I could. And sort of that's what led me to the, the Red Shoes Rock um, and some of the other places I've been. And, uh, you know, not to say when she's turned eight, when she turned 18, everything stopped too. You know, like there's no, no yeah. seamless transition. Nobody came to me and said, okay, here's where you go now. Here's your worker now. Uh, so we're right back to the beginning again and, and forging a path <laughs> again. So, um, you know, we still have some some issues. She's certainly not where I thought she was going to be in terms of the negative part. Um, she continues to uh, grow and, and surprise me um, and delight me and some of the things that she does and her awareness grows as she grows. Um, but it's still quite the journey, you know, so. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. And 
It leads me to my own questions, but we have questions here from uh, caregivers <laughs> and parents. And so let's get to those. Okay. okay, so a caregiver submitted this question. How do I manage sharing my child's story while maintaining their privacy? My child has FASD and I want my family to understand certain behaviors while respecting my child's privacy. So this one's really sort of tricky, I think, because it really, it's very personal, you know, and each family is, is different. Uh, for, for us, it was a little different because Nicole was eight and mm -hmm. she already had a life book she came with. It mentioned FASD, so she would tell people. So it was sort of always part of our conversation. Um, I never, you know, I didn't let the, the disability define her, but certainly there was things that people needed to know um, by that. I think you have to, you know, since it's talking about a family and not really the school or, or professionals, you have to balance it out with um, asking the family to respect that it is your child's story and mm -hmm. that when your child is ready to disclose whatever they want to, if they ever want to, that'll yes. be up to them. But at this time, you can say, you know, there are some challenges that my child has, and this is what my child needs to be successful. And I'd really appreciate your support in, in putting these in place or understanding them or making sure that uh, uh, we help the child meet with success. Um, I don't think everybody always needs to know. Um, mm -hmm. We're all different. We absolutely are all different. And uh, I don't think we should be disclosing uh, really. It's interesting because when I first started my blog, I, I shared probably more than I should have. And, and I do go back and I do take out things now and I do change things. And I've taken a couple posts down because I think you learn as you go yeah. um, about it. So I would just say, you know, it, it is your child's story to tell, but you yes. certainly, I think, can say these are the things my child requires. Yes. Yeah. Very mm -hmm. interesting. Um, if you had one piece of advice you could give to awaiting parents, parents who are uh, waiting to adopt, and you wanted to talk to them about raising a child with FASD, what advice would you give to them? Um, I always find it hard to narrow it down to one. So I'll, I'll oh, give you like a, a few. <laughs> sure. Uh, my, my first thing would be to learn uh, about FASD. You know, even if it's just suspected, I think really to, to take a, a course, uh, to, to read some books. I, mm -hmm. I hesitate, you know, you can talk to people, but I think you need to be aware of who you're talking to because some of the stories are quite dramatic and could, uh, really make you fear or worry unnecessarily yes. because all our paths are so different you know and, and a lot of people um, when they reach out they've sort of reached out because they didn't have that knowledge to begin with so educate yourself first with mm -hmm. reliable information uh, yes. would be my first first thing um, and line up any services or support you know that's where I think if, if you're waiting to adopt you talk to your worker about that. What are some of the supports and services that I'm going to need? Um, so you're aware of those a little ahead of time and you can create a little bit of a game plan and definitely include respite in there because you're going to absolutely need it for yourself and, and for your child. Um, and make sure you have a circle of support. Uh, I yeah. thought I did, turns out I didn't, um, but I found my circle online um, and mm. that helped immensely um, because I think you do need people who do understand because once I found them I was like oh my gosh it, it isn't just me mm -hmm. um, and my biggest thing I always always tell people is don't let how your child is after you do adopt define their future so how they are now is not necessarily going to be how they are in the future and there's so many negative things out there based on research in the past and we know we've come a long way yes People think the outcomes are determined and they are not and um I fell into that trap and I I said you know by the time Nicole's 16 you know blah 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 and and yes. none of that none of that happened yeah. um and and yeah things do happen 
everybody's path is different. But again, be in the here and now in the present. And don't worry so much about what's going to happen in the future, because it may never happen. So that takes away from what you can do now. So mm. that's my biggest piece of advice. Yeah, that's very good advice. I think you're referring to things like facts or no research well where they'll say this percentage will be in trouble with the law yeah. things like that so you start to think it's going to happen but you're right. right with the right interventions yeah because yeah. those people weren't yeah. having the support like I know there's still not support out there but their access to information is much more now so there are things yes. you can do absolutely um, yeah, yeah I agree uh, a parent gave um this question, I'm an adoptive parent to a child with FASD, and there are days where I am completely overwhelmed with the level of advocacy needed and often feel alone in the battle. Any suggestions on how to stay engaged and passionate and how can I become less isolated? So I touched on this uh, just previous that, uh, you know, you need to reach out and you really do need to find support somewhere and if that really is just somebody virtually uh, that's okay uh, because it could make a huge difference um you know when i started this journey there there weren't that many online groups uh and there were no um in-person support groups uh that i knew of in my area and the only one was an hour away which is okay in the, the nice weather but in the winter time it's yeah. it's not so nice uh, so I went to those a few times. So if there is a local uh, a local group, I would encourage going local. But I find with the online groups, what I love about them is there's so much experience in there that if you ask a question, you're going to get many different answers, but you're going to have access to a lot of information that's already been tested and tried. And you, yes. you take what you can use and you, and you get rid of the rest. But you might find something, you know, that you that uh, works. Um, I also find that I, uh, I get really invigorated when I go to conferences. Yes. And hear speakers. I, I learn new things, but I'm also um, I validated in that. Yeah, I am doing that or I do know that. Yes. So I think I think we don't give ourselves enough credit too. So I think that's really important. Um, you know, isolation is huge. <clears throat> As I said, I, I live in a really small rural area. I don't know another parent in person in my area who's raising somebody with FASD. Um, if I travel out, sure, I can meet them. But uh, when Nicole was uh, under 18, we had a, a woman who worked for Wraparound Northumberland, and she was just my rock. Um, I think you can find a support that way. We have FASD workers now. We never yeah, had those exactly. uh, when I was exactly. raising a goal. Last couple of years, and, and ours was great. Um, but one thing I find is, um, you know, when I'm absolutely exhausted and I don't think I can go on anymore, I just sit with that and I accept that that's how I'm feeling. And what is it that I need? And sometimes I just need to rest and and sometimes I need to do nothing, you know, and sometimes Nicole needs to do nothing. And it's okay. We're a society that glorifies being busy and go, go, go. And sometimes we, we don't need any of that. Uh, so we do need to rest. Um, and I'm going to read something that uh, when I was really at a down place just recently, somebody responded <clears throat> to a Twitter uh, post that I had put up, excuse me, and she put, um, and I hope this helps, the person who asked this question. It's a marathon you run daily, but you get stronger. You develop courage, your heart breaks, but you don't. Your beloveds cannot survive without you. And you are a goddamn heroine. Tell this to yourself every chance you get until you believe it, because it all depends on you. And that blew me away. And so I read that when I get a little bit down, because I think yes. we say that to our kids, but we don't say that to ourselves enough. Yes. So start telling yourself you're a heroine, a hero, a warrior. <clears throat> yeah. And rest. And then you'll be able to get out, get at it again. That's so powerful. And especially that line, 
your heart breaks, but you don't. Wow. Isn't it? Yeah. I'm like, that's quite something. Yeah. And I didn't really, I mean, I, she's, she follows me, but we've not really talked much, but <clears throat> yeah, the power somebody has just from saying something is amazing. Yeah. Wow. Very impactful. Thank you. Uh, as a parent, Yvonne, how do you balance your own self-care? And you just touched on this, but how do you balance your own self-care and advocate for yourself and your needs while still advocating for Nicole's? One of the biggest things I, I had to do uh, when I was working full-time, it was impossible. Yeah. So for me, because I'm a single mom and I don't have support, it just, it, I couldn't do it. I couldn't manage and um, I really was stressed out um, and things were really crazy. So quitting my job was probably the best thing I ever did back then. Yeah. Um, although I didn't know what we were gonna do, uh, we managed and we survived. Um, and then I decided that, uh, you know, um, I reworked how things were gonna be and, and part-time worked for me, but I have my mom living with us. So there's some support yeah. that way. Yeah. Um, Nicole qualified for a disability tax credit when she was under 18. So we had some money that way. And I took on some part-time contracts, but I stopped thinking I had to work full-time. I thought I could, but, but, but I couldn't. Yeah. Um, when she was at school, it was a lot easier for me to, to do self-care because she was at school. Yeah. It's harder now. She's not, um, she's not working. And then with COVID, uh, the three of us yes. have been in the house together for almost two years. But one thing I did keep from when I was working is I get up an hour before everybody else every morning and I sit and I have my coffee and uh, then I take yes. the dog for a walk and I, I do that regardless. And I go to bed before everybody else. And, uh, you know, it, it, it might not help my social life much, but <laughs> <laughs> I find that I need my sleep. And when I yes. don't sleep now, I know for some with younger kids, it's really hard. I get that. I do understand that. Um, but you will get there. You know, I promise it, uh, it will happen. And then the other big thing is we've had respite uh, on and off. But right now, too, we do have somebody that she connects with virtually twice a week uh, for mm -hmm. two hours. And I use those two hours for me. Um, so yes. you just got to try to find little parts of your day. Sometimes it can only be 10 minutes. I mean, I used to go out, I used to love to garden and then she'd follow me outside. Can I help, you know, water the grass? And I'm like, mm, sure, <laughs> you know, but I was out there to, to be there on my own. She doesn't offer that anymore. <laughs> and now right. I'm over, I want her to help me. Um, but just finding the little snippets of the day um, and, and reminding yourself that, you know, you do, you do need to find something that brings you joy and that brings light into your life because, you, you won't survive if, if you don't. Um, you'll be mm -hmm. like this frazzled, uh, frazzled mess. Um, I did try to go back to work when she uh, was an adult in 2018. And that was, that was a disaster again. Um, interestingly, yeah. we took, we did a course for three months. And so I could only work four days uh, a week, which was approved. But boy, it, it really helped us. But then my employer at the time said, it's a five day of work week, we need you in the office. This was pre COVID, um, you know, where they thought everything had to be done in the office. And I right. thought, you know, all I'm asking for is one day, you know, off, like, so I could have one day to do what I needed to do, and then the other to recoup. Um, and yeah, do that. so I think be realistic about what you can achieve, and we can't achieve it all. Um, and be creative in, in figuring that out. I'm lucky now because um, I've been working with Jeff Noble um, yes. at home. <laughs> uh, I've worked on and off uh, with him. I started admitting on his, uh, his caregiver success uh, support mm -hmm. group back in 2018. And then I did a little bit of paid work for him on and off. But last March, he said to me, hey, you know, um, I can give you some hours, some steady hours. It's part time, but I work from home and, and our things have, have, you know, become better again because I'm not Good. stressed out, you know, I am able to be here for her. Uh, so I think really looking at what is going to work for your family, not what you think you should be doing. Yeah. Hmm. And then just being committed to doing something for yourself. 
um, cause I'm hard. I, I don't always do it. Um, but I always make sure I take that time in the morning now. And that's really sort of key to me. And I'm pretty good about saying, no, you're not allowed to get up. <laughs> <laughs> that's good. Yeah. You're sort of refilling your own cup before that's you right. refill hers. Right. Yeah. Oh, now, if you could put together a toolbox for, for your daughter on helping her learn to self-advocate. And I know she's already doing a very good job yeah. of ad advocacy work, but what would you put in that toolbox for her? For her, um, I modeled a lot of it. <clears throat> so okay. for her to see how I was, how I was advocating for her. So she's always grown up hearing me um, advocate for her. And when she yes. got to be a bit older, uh, she was involved in the meetings and she may not have participated in those meetings because she can be quite shy and quiet actually. You wouldn't know that sometimes. Um, but we would talk about what, what it was that we were gonna talk about and did she want to bring anything up or did I need to bring anything up on her behalf? So helping her sort of think a little bit about what it was that, that she needed. Um, a big part has been her helping me with the advocacy because I don't think she okay. really, could understand what it was um, that she needed uh, because it, mm -hmm. that's a lot of self-reflection, you know, and, and she's yeah. getting there now, older, but wasn't really sort of there when she was younger. So she would see my involvement in the Red Shoes Rock. And then mm -hmm. she started wearing red shoes and she started making posts on her own uh, Facebook page saying what she was doing. Um, so that started, uh, her, you know, mm -hmm. she was starting to think about, oh, yeah, so... That, that is what I need. And then she would listen to other adults with FASD speak. Yes. And that was huge because then it was like, oh my gosh, I had those troubles too. Um, mm -hmm. And so then she could put the two and two together. Cause of course, you know, we have a great relationship but I'm still her mom. So I'm not always the one she's gonna listen to. Um, so yeah. hearing other people talk, huge for her. Finding opportunities to talk. We went to an all candidates meeting at the last provincial election. She got up and asked a question of all the candidates. What are you going to do for FASD? Wow. Good for and, her. Yeah, that was huge. You know, um, yeah. she wrote a letter to uh, Pierre Trudeau or Pierre to uh, Justin Trudeau. You can tell how old I am. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. To, uh, to Justin. And, uh, and we found out he was going to be close to us. So we drove down there and, uh, she pushed her way in the crowd. Uh, at, first they, yeah, at first, the police officer said, <clears throat> nobody can give him anything. You know, you can't give him that. And so she was a bit upset. And I said, well, let's see when he comes out what you can do. And she got her way in there and, and handed it to him, got a picture with him. Wow. You know, said in her little note what, what uh, she needed assistance with. You know, so <clears throat> I think trying to look at different ways to get them to yeah. advocate, um, you know, and then uh, I've really tried hard for her to, to believe in herself and know that she does have certain rights um, and sh she can speak up for herself. Um, she's better at it because she's more of an extrovert than I am, um, but she gives me strength too. Um, so, yes. uh, you know, always being open and honest with her, with them too is a good, uh, is a good way to be. Um, and, uh, you know, um, if she has to, to do anything where she does need to advocate, we'll sit down and we'll create a little plan. What is it she wants to say? What, what could they say? What does she want the outcome to be? Um, and then uh, uh, we go from there. <laughs> okay. So let's talk a little bit more about your blog, which I happen to love and follow our sacred breath, finding calm in the chaos of FASD. So I'm curious how you came up with the title and I want to know if you have a favorite blog post that you wrote. Right. Um, I started it back in 2014. Yeah. And uh, at that part, <clears throat> my life was a bit of a chaos <laughs> um, because we didn't have a lot of sports back then when I first yes. started it didn't have a lot of connection, couldn't find a lot of information from other parents online. So I thought, well, I'm going to, I'm going to start something and I'm going to write and writing is cathartic for me. Yes. And maybe if I can help somebody else along the same way, um, I'm doing two things. 
So we used to have this respite worker and uh, she would show up to pick Nicole up and she was like calm and collected, you know, and I just immediately she'd walk in and I just felt calm. Yeah. And I'm all frazzled. Oh my, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, you know, uh, this has happened, this has happened. And I thought, I want to be like her. You know, I want to find that calm in the chaos that I feel. Um, so I started to realize that I needed to, I needed to sort of center myself. I needed to, to slow down, uh, to not do those things that I thought everybody wanted us to do. Um, and that's how I, I started creating calm in the chaos and uh, where I came up with my little tagline and the our sacred breath part of it. There was a poem um, that uh, really meant a lot to me and, and that's on the blog, uh, the actual poem. And uh, that's why I chose the name too. So it's just all about breathing, uh, centering yourself because that's like one of the easiest things you can do. Hard to do, but yeah. easy to do as well. So and do you uh, my have favorite a... yeah yes go ahead um that's hard too uh <laughs> i do have a page on the blog where the the 10 most popular posts are i sort of have mm. three i think the one that was the most popular <clears throat> and uh spoke to the most people was uh, what happens when no one cares for the caregiver and i think i had like 10,000 views on that which is huge for my little blog um, and I think it just really spoke to so many people. And it was simply prompted by a quote that said, shouting self-care at people who actually need community care is how we fail people. Absolutely. And that was just my story. I just got it all out. Because at the time, I think it was when I was went back to work full time and I was feeling unsupported. So that one, I think, spoke to people the most. Uh, my favorite one is 12 Wishes for My Daughter in FASD. Yes. And I wrote that one about five years ago and I, and I update it. And why I like that one is because it really made me think about her and what I do want for her and what, what is out there for her. And then I get to see how I have grown when I go back as well as her and have any of my wishes changed? Have they come true? Which ones, have, which ones don't I need to wish for anymore? Which have, which have been adjusted? So that would be my my uh, my personal favorite, and then of course the one I'm proudest of is the 99 days whole series yes. um, yeah. because I poured my heart and soul into that, <clears throat> and I think that that one is you know that one introduced me to a lot of people. Yes, uh, and so I think uh, that one's just the one that uh, that I'm most proud of writing. I think. Well, well, you should be very proud and I repost your blogs regularly on my FASD Ottawa social media and I find thank you. <laughs> you are well thank you because you're making a big difference and I know from caregivers that I have spoken with that that your blogs have a big impact and I think the main reasons are because you're really frank and honest and open but at the same time you're always speaking so respectfully about Nicole and you also help to maintain hope for the right. future, not only for your own family, but for everybody else's. So even though you tackle the tough subjects, you do it in a really positive way. So I'm curious what kind of feedback you've gotten from, from followers and where are your followers from? It, it's interesting because I don't get a lot of feedback on the actual blog. So there mm -hmm. isn't a lot of people that make comments. There's one guy who's been following me for a little bit and he's such a great uh, inspirational person because he always comments, he you know, tells me how, how the post has, has affected him or you know, um, gives me a little bit of moral support if it's one that I'm talking about something I'm having a tough time with. Uh, but I know they're out there because they get shared. Uh, so sometimes yes. I'll catch a glimpse of one that somebody has shared. And I think, you know, for me, when people tell me that something I've said is something they didn't think about, or um, they, they're going to use that and they get back and they say, you know, this has made a difference, or they thank me for being so positive, is when it makes uh, me feel good. Because sometimes I feel like I'm writing into a void. 
and I don't get a lot of feedback. So sometimes I think, ah, you know, maybe I should stop and, you know, who's reading this? Uh, and, and then I'll get a comment or I'll find a post and, and somebody says the very kind things that you've just said that I don't often hear. And, and I'm not writing it to hear those things. I'm writing it because it's good for me to get it out. But I yes. also know how alone I felt when I first started this journey. So I'm hoping that other people aren't feeling as alone. But I have to tell you, I, I went to a meeting once in Savannah, who's an adult with FASD. Yes. Was there. And yeah. when I said what I, you know, I, I wrote this blog and she comes running over to me again, pre-COVID, gives me a big hug. Oh my gosh, we love our sacred breath. I read every post, you know, and so things like that, you know, really touch me and make me feel good because again, I'm not out there to get all the, the praise and the recognition. Um, but when you hear that, that what you're doing is making a difference and to get that kind of feedback from an individual with FASD, you know, you're doing yes. okay. Um, and I remember Elspeth Ross, yeah. who I met in 2018 for the first time, you know, gave me a huge compliment too. And that was huge uh, coming from her. And she just appreciated that I, I source things and I put my references down because she's a librarian. So it's important for her to be factual. Yes. Um, so yeah, I, I think, and, and Sophie Kowali uh, follows my blog, mm -hmm. um, who introduced uh, FAS Day in the, in the house and has uh, introduced the first bill for FASD Education Act. And that was amazing too. You know, so yes. I quietly do these things and then I hear about it a little bit and that just keeps me going. Oh, and where do you go when you need support and what resources have you found helpful? Um, well, I talked about the online world because again, yes, yeah, I don't have a lot of support. I have met a few people through the online and so if we go to conferences, I do connect with people that way. Um, but online definitely is, is my major source of support. Um, I'm gonna give a little plug for this new group that's starting because <clears throat> I find, I think I mentioned before for us or for me, this is a brand new journey for me, uh, supporting yeah. an adult. And how do you support an adult respectfully? Um, knowing that they do need support, but also respecting the fact that they are an adult. Nicole is wonderful because for the most part, she will accept it, but I still don't know the first thing. And I don't know if I'm doing the right thing. So now there's this new group for, for people who identify as seniors, um, who, are oh. raising, <laughs> who are raising um, adults uh, with FASD uh, that, uh, that you, Nancy, are coordinating. And I was so excited to find that. Because yes. although I'm always happy to help people who are coming up behind me and share our story and, and offer what I can, I think that, uh, you know, there isn't, there isn't enough for people who are sort of with adults, specifically just adults. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I hope I can offer to that as well as learn from that. Um, so there's not a lot um, sort of out there. Um, um, and again, I did mention, you know, I, I go to a lot of conferences, I, I read a lot yeah. of books. Well, I don't read as many books as I should be right now, but watching Zoom um, things. So that's sort of where I get, where I get my uh, information and support. And oh, I think you asked me too, though, and I didn't answer that one about the um, followers on my blog. They're from all around the world. I'm surprised yeah. how, when I see them. My, the big ones are US, Canada. Australia and England. Um, but every country probably at some point has seen one of the posts. So it's really interesting to see that that it, it's it's around the world. I and mean, then I love to see that. That's so cool. And let's we're almost out of time, but how is Nicole doing? And um, how do you think her taking on more of an advocacy role is helping her? I know she's helping others, but how is that helping her? Uh, Nicole's doing well. Um, again, being stuck at home in COVID has, I think, been difficult um, because we we didn't we weren't too involved to begin with in things, but anything that we were involved with has completely stopped. We were lucky to get uh, this um, virtual support person, so she's able to connect with somebody, which I think has really greatly helped her. Um, and she loves to uh, 
to speak now to people about her experience. And I think for her, it has increased her confidence, you know, a thousandfold. Because we have had, you know, setback, challenge after challenge after setback. Um, and nobody, nobody wanted to listen to her before. Um, they thought they knew. And mm. now she's able to share her story. And no, it's no longer a sad story for her because she's helping somebody else yes. come up behind her. And I really mm. do see how she lights up when she's talking to somebody. We went to a conference a few years ago in, in Burlington, and there was, I think, 250 people there. And that's the most she had ever spoken to, like really huge. That's a lot. Yeah. She got up there and she blew them all away. And I was so proud of her. Um, she, you know, I'd been watching her rehearse her, her uh, talk, but she got up there and she was engaging and she was making jokes, you know, and I could see people were we're engaging with her. And then when people ask her questions and she can answer those questions, it yeah. teaches her about her as well. And then she's helping people. So I think her presenting and her advocacy has done more to help her um, become more positive um, and realize that it's okay to have FASD. You know, th there are very positive things um, and she can make a difference and her life does matter. Um, and her experience matters. So I'm really pleased that she she enjoys it. Um, and, and I hope that we can continue sharing our story as time goes on. Yeah. I think I answered you. I tend to go on, so. <laughs> no. Oh, dear. <laughs> no. It sounds like you're so intuitive. Um, you really are, Avon. Chantal, should I be passing it over to you? I'm looking at the time. Yeah, I know the time always goes by so quickly. <laughs> it um, does. I, I think we got to most of the questions. If we didn't answer your question, we will uh, be sure to reach out to you um, directly uh, to make sure that you have some answers or some supports or resources to help you. If you're watching this on replay and you do have a question, um, for Yvonne or about FASD, you can feel free to put them in the comments or if you prefer, you can email us directly. Um, um, you can email me, Chantal, at adoptforlife.com or generally at info at adoptforlife and we'll be sure to put you in touch with someone that um, can offer you those resources. Um, Yvonne, um, uh, it was, I, this is the first time I met you, so it was an absolute pleasure <laughs> meeting with you and thank you um, so much. Like all your answers were just so, um, you know, just from the heart and really honest. Um, and it's really, really appreciative to, to be so open with us and Thank all you. of us watching, I'm sure they really appreciate it as well. Um, Nancy, thanks again for jumping in uh, and being our host. Can I just pass it back to you quickly? Cause you're hosting a webinar this mm -hmm. Thursday. In two days, yes. In two so days. Thursday in two day. Yes, in two days. So uh, there's still time to register. The webinar on Thursday night uh, from seven to nine is for caregivers or for the support networks for caregivers. So if you are a relative or a neighbor or a friend of someone with FASD or of a caregiver of someone with FASD, this will be really helpful for you. We're going to be looking at Adopt for Life's book, FASD and Me, Strengthening My Community, which is packed with FASD information, but it also is customizable. And the young person with FASD can fill the book in with their strengths and challenges and triggers. So you really get to know them as a unique person. So we're gonna talk about how caregivers can use that, how they can uh, fill out the book with their child, what the benefits are and how they can share it within their community, but also for community members, how they can use that as a way to start conversations and be better equipped to support people with FASD. So I, there's no charge. Uh, Health Nexus is a sponsor. It's hosted by Adopt for Life. I'm thrilled to do it. And we also have a, a woman with FASD who's going to be joining us and, and talking about how this book would have helped her if she'd had it when she was younger. That's great. Yeah, so there's still time to register. Um, if you just go to um, adoptforlife.com uh, slash webinars, you'll find all the information there and how to register. 
Uh, next week, and Nancy's back again as our uh, guest host, and we're going to be talking to Dr. James Reynolds, um, part of Kids Brain Health Network. So uh, be sure to tune in for that. We have a lot of great information for everyone. Um, I feel like I'm missing something. Oh, yeah. So if you follow us on social media, you might have noticed that we did a giveaway last end of last week for um, um, the book, FASD and Me. We're giving away a few copies. So um, stay tuned because we're going to announce the winners later today. Um, and we're probably going to run another one before the end of the month. So keep your eye out for that. Um, if you're not following us, uh, so like and follow our page and that way you won't miss out on all that we're doing. So an another big, big thank you. I'm sorry if I'm going over time. Uh, Nancy and Yvonne, again, thanks so much uh, for being with us today. I wish everybody well and uh, have a great week. Take care of thank yourselves. You. Thanks so thanks. much. Bye. Bye.